Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Cover Eagle, and welcome. Today, we change direction on the Japanese macaque habitat and introduce something new. Hope you enjoy. Let's get building. When we initially get here, just do a little bit of contemplating to decide what we're going to do, and ultimately, we decide to go with the doll sheep. The Japanese macaque has just been extremely problemat problematic with all of the issues that we've had with trying to keep them contained. And while we weren't having any escapes last time, it still was a bit of a problem. Right now, we're just checking to see if we have any doll sheep because I have used them in another zoo. Unfortunately, I do not. So I'm buying some sheep and that should uh, suffice for what we need to do. I did just grab like one of the ones that... Uh, Another player had done, and then uh, the rest of them are from the Frontier Zoo. Not too big of a deal. And <clears throat> now we're going to start getting ready to clear out this habitat. One discovery that we make right here is that we have too many animals in our animal trading center. You can only have a total of 50, and since I had just bought six sheep, I didn't have enough space to put the eight Japanese macaque in there. So we need to go through and start selling off some of the animals. So we're going to go through and sell off some of the animals, uh, the naming convention that I have, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. It does make it a little bit easier. Usually anything that has a two at the end of it is something that I will typically sell off, where anything with a one I will normally keep. However, that's not always the case. It's just more of a generational thing. But since this is a slightly different zoo and some of these animals I just haven't even used in a long time. Before we press on, again, got to come in here and fix the red panda habitat because, again, their climbing stuff just isn't registering. Hopefully that bug goes away at some point soon. Now we're going to go ahead and get clearing out the habitat here of all the different things. Most of that building there is associated with the castle wall and the keeper hut on the opposite side. So we need to make sure that we don't just hit the building and hit delete. We want to make sure that we go through and actually delete all of the individual objects. We're going to also take away all of our anti-climbing devices because at the end of the day, it just was, there were so many things that we had to put up, so many different things that were changing the overall design that it was just getting very frustrating. And in all honesty, this is probably the one of the first times that I've ever actually moved on from a, from an animal that I've put into a zoo just because it wasn't working quite the way that I was wanting it to work. It does get a little bit problematic trying to delete some of the uh, riot, or, uh, rusted metal rods over here just because it's interfering with another object, like particularly this one with that tower there. It just is not working out. So I had to get super close to it so I could finally delete it. But ultimately that went pretty quick. And now we're going to go through and just get rid of all of the plaster pieces because while it doesn't look bad, it's just it wasn't necessary. So we'll go ahead and take all of those out which takes a little bit of time to go through and do, but ultimately it still lets us have a very nice looking habitat while being able to hopefully have an animal that's not an issue. I did check the doll sheep. They need a, uh, I think it's a 1.5 meter high barrier and they are not climbers, although they do like to jump, which is one of the things that's really nice. And we'll see later when we get into some of the rock work that it actually works out pretty well to have them in a habitat where you put a lot of rocks because most of the animals, even if they're kind of animals that can jump, don't seem to do really well with being able to walk over some of the edges of the rocks when you kind of lay them down. But for the dull sheep, for whatever reason, they seem to be pretty proficient at it. And in other habitats that I've built for them, I've used uh, more three-dimensional space where it's got some other elevation. And they're kind of jumping around from rock to rock and everything else. So it surprises me a little bit that they're not escape artists. However, it's still something that we needed to take into consideration. Or, well, I guess that we don't have to really worry about here is them being able to jump around. But it does give us the flexibility to use rocks and whatnot uh, to kind of decorate the habitat. Now we're going to go through and start taking out some of the other enrichment items. We discovered that that piano was more than just a piano here in just a moment. As you can see there, there's a missing wall segment now, and I just discovered that. Hitting Control z put it back, and then we just have to go in and figure out where exactly we had that included. One of the things you have to keep in mind when working with buildings is when you start putting down new objects, 
you have to fix or you have to select those objects and get them out of there. Also, because we deleted the building, even doing a control Z doesn't fix the work zone. So we got to go ahead and take care of that as well. It's time to build the fence for this particular habitat because the doll sheep is not an animal that the guest can be in the space with. I still wanted a cold animal. And this, the doll sheep is one of the animals that doesn't require a huge amount of space, but still needs to have a separation between themselves and the guests. Now, the reason I went ahead and stayed with this particular plan is because that path is still inside the habitat. So the guests will get all giddy that they get to be in a doll sheep habitat, an animal that they're not supposed to be able to be in a habitat with. It's just there will be a physical barrier, which is this fence that we're building now to keep them under or keep them separated. The problem with this particular fence, and we'll see this when we get to the traversable area after we build this, is that the fence itself is perfectly fine, but it does chew out a lot of traversable area because now they can't use the path where the guests are walking as traversable area like our Japanese McCut could. And so that's something that we had to take into consideration as we were building this too. I did leave the trash bins where they were. I just moved them just ever so slightly and it ends up working out really well that the trash bin is also a good way to kind of block that. Now, ideally, probably wouldn't use trash bins inside of a habitat like this because the animal could probably just knock it over, stick their head in, something along those lines. But we also need to make sure that we have a place for the guests to throw trash away along this path. Now, it might have made more sense to put the trash bins on the opposite side of the pathway where the guests are separated from the animal so the animal doesn't have an opportunity to get over there. And maybe that's a fix that we'll make at some point in the future simply because I want to try to keep this as legitimate looking as possible. We're just going to continue doing this. It doesn't take a whole lot longer to finish this up, but it's still a little bit slow going because I want to make sure that the pillars, the, uh, the supports aren't necessarily clipping with the, the path edge there. I could have taken the path edge away, but because we already have everything else kind of decorated and stuff with the path edge in mind or the curb, I wanted to go ahead and just keep it in place simply because it was easier and we've already spent like three episodes working on this particular or more working on this particular habitat. And quite honestly, I'm kind of done with it. I really just want to be over and done with this habitat. And by the end of this episode, we should be able to move on to something bigger and better. One of the things that I'm really excited about with patch 1.4 coming out is being able to multi-select animals when we go to put them into the habitat which we'll see is kind of a problem still as we deal with trying to get the sheep in here uh, and here in just a few, like probably another minute or so. On top of that, they have the aquatic pack that's coming out, uh, which I will buy that DLC as soon as it comes out on December 8th, which is Tuesday. And it'll be awesome because now they're including some underwater animals like penguins and seals and those kind of things. I don't know that it's really changing the mechanics of the game a whole lot with regard to it's the same kind of animals stuff that we've dealt with before. It's not really any different than like a pygmy hippo or a polar bear or something like that. Other than these animals will probably spend far more time in the water than they will on the surface, but they'll probably still have a land and uh, like water requirement to go along with that. It'd be interesting. I don't, I don't remember all the animals. I think they're introducing five new ones. It'd be interesting to see if all of the animals uh, have the same kind of requirements with regards to like the balance. Now here's the quarantine thing I was talking about. I still have to select each animal one at a time and move them into quarantine, which is a real pain. And the worst thing is you can go into the animal management tab of your zoo and get in there and multi-select animals. But the problem is when you first put them in your trade center, it just says trade center. So those animals aren't actually available to this zoo yet. So it's like a, a holding ground between the where you buy the animals and where you um, actually have the animals move into your zoo. And I mean, it's great because, you know, it's all the same container and so I can use them wherever I want in different zoos and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it's still kind of a pain to not be able to multi-select. And I'm really glad that we can do that because it's something that we could do in pretty much every other mode of the game. 
The keepers or caretakers are bringing the animals in, and the first thing that we're going to do is check the traversable area to make sure that our fence is working. Unfortunately, I counted on the foliage at the other end to be a blockage, but it didn't work, so we're going to have to go ahead and take care of that. And we saw that we had an okay amount of space for the animals. However, once we get this done and we get this locked in, this is where it's really going to tell us how much space we actually have for our animals when we get them in here. Additionally, you need a minimum of three, and I have six coming in. So that's also something else to keep in mind. So now I do have that one animal, and there's a very, very small little sliver of space left. So we do need to make sure that we have that taken care of as we move forward to make sure that our animals are happy. In addition to that, we need to go ahead and remove the foliage, which we just did because there was a lot of stuff from the Asian continent. These are North American animals. We need to take care of that. Again, we have too many sheep now. That space went into the yellow, so we need to go ahead and fix that. In addition, we're kind of going through and fixing some of the animal names. We do a little bit more of this later. My general thing is the Generation 1s are named 1. All of the babies have a 2 at the end of the name. And that's just to make sure that I can keep them kind of straight so I don't have 2s breeding with 1s. And then eventually when all of the 1s pass away, I'll keep a couple 2s and we'll move on. I've moved out some of the older animals in the habitat in an effort to keep the breeding and everything going on. But even still, we have such a small amount of space. I'm probably going to be able to let them breed like one time. And then we're going to have to just stop it until they get old enough to move on and uh, send to a different zoo or something like that. Now, uh, in our quest to continue to make the animals happy, the only thing that was really an issue was the enrichment items. So we're going to go ahead and get them in there and make sure that they are taken care of with that. Fortunately, we already have these animals in a different zoo and already have the maximum research done. So it's really easy and simple, which is a lovely change that they've added. Now it's time to go in here and do rock work. We did talk about doing this rock work before when the Japanese macaque were here. So it's not really anything doing that we're doing that's different or special. We just go in here and make sure a number of times that this is still a traversable area for the doll sheep. To make sure that they can still cross this space and we're not chewing up any more of the limited territory that they already have. It's going to take a little while to go through here and do this. We're going to do a mix of rocks between the savanna, ter savanna biome, which is the biome we're in, grassland, as well as snow, just simply because we have an animal that likes cold. And not that the white rocks have any bearing on how much snow is actually considered in the habitat. It's still something that's nice. I do kind of wish that they would go back to where they had the rocks take into consider be taken into consideration when it was their their terrain makeup in that if you had rock surface that they were on then it counted a rock even if you were covering up long grass or dirt or something along those lines but i can understand where they maybe took away took that away because it makes it really hard to decorate a habitat or really get kind of around the edge of uh, water sources and add rocks and stuff like that. So I, I understand both sides of the the argument, but it would be kind of nice, even if there was a toggle that I could say, do this or don't do this. And maybe there is, and I don't know it, but I was, I'm pretty sure it was something they took away just simply because it was a problem that was frustrating. I think a lot of players, they would be putting rocks, building a a uh, hard shelter out of rocks or something like that, and then an animal that was sensitive to the amount of rock in that area, in particular, like maybe a tropical animal or something like that, was getting upset because there was too much rocky terrain in their habitat, and therefore they couldn't, they didn't have that flexibility. I would still say that if you're really looking for that flexibility, maybe play in a different mode that doesn't require that. But again, I think it should be a kind of toggle type thing. While we have a little bit of time before we kind of move on to the next thing, we're building a lot of these rock, uh, like these rock formations and everything else. You'll see that I'm generally trying to keep everything flat and something that the animal can kind of traverse across without it being too big of a deal. So it's not just throwing a bunch of rocks down and calling it a day. It's still trying to make sure that it's just the rock surface that we're seeing instead of the actual terrain surface. But what I was talking about with the different game modes, that's one thing that I really, really appreciate about Planet coaster planet zoo and a lot of the frontier games and i can't 
I can't say a whole lot about the other games because I've only really played Planet Coaster and Planet Zoo, but these two games specifically really are kind of near and dear to my heart simply because there are so many different ways to play these games. And they do add a number of different options and customizations that make it that you can do things like in, for instance, Planet Zoo, I can slow the animal aging down. So I'm not fighting with animals if I want to look animals breeding and uh, aging up and all of these kind of things while I'm trying to build something if I were to build in kind of real time with a zoo going on. So all of the different game modes really allow for almost any type of player. You have sandbox mode, which I know a lot of people do simply because you can just build and not worry about it. Uh, I prefer to play in either franchise or challenge mode because I like to have some sort of risk versus reward type thing going on. I do need to try to play in hard mode just to see if I'm adept at that at a larger zoo instead of just the scenarios. But it's just nice to have some something to kind of hold me accountable when playing. And then you still have your scenarios, which, you know, you're just trying to fix the different problems that might come up. They're very fun. I haven't actually tried the timed scenarios yet. Uh, they're really, the requirements for them are really high. And like, as soon as you get into the game, the timer goes and it doesn't matter whether the game's paused or not. So there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of different things that you can really do in this game to really kind of enjoy the most from it. And I think that's one of the things that's a really good selling point and makes it that a variety of different people like it. We're going to check the snow leopards to make sure that any of the foliage that we're putting in isn't an issue. We do have to delete some because for whatever reason, it seems to be bouncing between 15 and 17%. Now we're going to go ahead and get plants in for our doll sheep. And like I said before, the thing to consider is that while they're both tundra taiga type animals, they're from completely different continents. So the doll sheep is a North American animal where the snow leopard is an Asian animal. Because of that Asian animal, a lot of the plants that don't cross between Asia and North America, we can't really use. And then again, we still have that same issue because the two habitats are stacked on top of each other that in certain places, any foliage we put down, even if it was something that bridged both continents, is still not going to be sufficient for our snow leopards simply because the snow leopards don't like foliage from that particular environment. So we had to make sure that we took care or took that into account as we kind of built through a lot of this. And we don't really have too many huge problems as we go through here, but it's still something that is just kind of a pain. I'm not regretting in any way building a habitat over a habitat. I think it's a really interesting way to kind of maximize the space that you have in a zoo. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a, uh, a YouTube series that I was watching uh, by attacking toucans. I, I don't know if it's, it's still his name or not, but he uh, was doing what was called a tiny park challenge. And so they went in and somebody went in and built a scenario and they built a, a whole set of pretty ridiculous requirements. And it was this tiny, tiny little patch. It was kind of reminiscent of the end scenario in this of the how small the patch of land was and how you had to be really creative and working with the different things that are available in the game to really kind of maximize that space. But this was so ridiculous. And he had to have something like, I, I think a total of like 13 roller coasters or something like that in a very, very small space. So the only real options that he had, because he couldn't build out, because as we all know, these maps are gargantuan in size from a, like how spread out they are. But in order to, with this tiny park challenge, the map, area that he could build in was extremely small. And in that, he had to get creative. And so instead of being able to go out on like the two-dimensional kind of thing, he had to take a three-dimensional approach to it and build underground and above ground. And he had a whole lot of rides and stuff like that. And it wasn't just throw some things down and move on. He was still very dedicated to making sure he decorated everything, made sure he built everything the way that he would expect it to kind of look. And working underground, that's actually one of the areas where I learned about hitting L on the keyboard whenever you're playing because it turns on the torch or flashlight. And that was something that even he learned during that time because it was something that was very frustrating for him going through, trying to play, and not being able to see very well under the ground. Then that 
hitting L just was like a game changer. And all of a sudden he was like, I, I can see it's the most amazing thing I've ever dealt with. So seeing how he kind of built and dealt with things there really kind of gave some idea of kind of stacking different habitats and everything here. The difference here is that with the rides in Planet Coaster, other than the scenery kind of sharing decoration type things, the animals, like no, nothing in the game is sensitive to the decorations. You can put whatever decorations, whatever, you can just spam a whole bunch of the same thing and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it looks or whatever, but here you decorate with a bunch of plants and you can make certain animals mad or something like that. And it's all about the animal welfare in this game. All right, moving on to the education boards. So obviously we had the Japanese macaque in there. We had gotten a lot of the education and everything set up for them. We deleted the education boards that we built last time. So we're going to come in here and we're going to a change what we currently have, which includes all of the speakers includes all of the, uh, the wall panels that we already had up. And then we're going to go through and actually include new wall panels to make sure that all of this stuff is set up properly. We don't have to add any more speakers because the coverage is still the same. And then here, we're just going to do something relatively simple. We're just going to kind of incorporate these similar to what we did with the iron or the, uh, the rusted metal bars. We're just going to incorporate these a little bit to make sure that they are in the habitat, that they are built relatively well that they don't look like they're just kind of flopped down. And then uh, I also like to make sure that there's no foliage or anything like that poking through. And then I was really trying to think of a way to kind of go across the top with something like this, whether it be one of these beams or something like that, but they're not exactly two meters across. And at that point, it was just one of those where I'd have to overlay different rocks or not different rocks, sorry, different logs or something along those lines in order to make the uh, make it look right. And so I think I just ultimately decided on leaving it with just those two pillars upright. I'd even considered maybe stringing lights across the top or whatever. The only thing is I'm not a huge fan of the festive lights. And so I didn't want to put them in there because it's just, it doesn't really fit with the theme of what's going on here. I did find a lighting solution that we'll see here in a little bit, but for the time being, what I was at least attempting to do out originally just wasn't quite in the cards. And so I just didn't want to uh, spend a lot of time dealing with that. Um, Cause again, I'm kind of over this particular habitat and moving on that quick cut. There was my recording software just arbitrarily stopped because I got a notification from Ubisoft about one of my friends getting into game. And that meant that uh, shadow play was like, Oh, you must've exited out of the application. So therefore we're going to stop. I, I don't know. I'm still learning some of this stuff. So it's just one of those just kind of dealing with it. So that's where that kind of random cut was. I try not to do too many cuts here. I also did make sure that instead of it being at 700%, it's only at 350%. So let me know what you think about the overall build speed here. It ended up working out that I'm still able to get a relatively uh, decent video length, about half an hour, uh, which is what my goal is. I don't want to, other than live streams, I don't really want the standard videos to go too much longer than that. But let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts on that. So here's where I'm starting to take a look at some of the option or the uh, light options. I think I just, because they are from the North and these particular torches are from the Northern set, I decided to go ahead and just put them in there. It's actually really nice that these uh, climbable beams have a lot of different snap points on them and it made it extremely easy to get that put into place. Now we've got pretty much everything done. We wanted to go ahead and take a look and see just kind of how things were going. I think I missed some education boards as I was going through. I think there's still one that I missed, but it took me a little while to figure it out. But wanted to just see like what the guests thought, how the animals really were seeing how happy they were, making sure that our snow leopards still aren't upset or anything like that. Now we're just going to go ahead and check the rest of the zoo because that's something that we haven't done in an extremely long time. And we need to make sure that we do that. And that's also where we're going to go through and fix naming any other animals that we haven't done in a little while. Cause it's been a while since I've done that. I I've said it before. This is like multiple games at the same time. There's definitely the animal management thing. There's the creative building component. And so you just kind of have to, I pause a lot just to make sure that I'm only dealing with what I can deal with at one time. 
And I, you know, whatever works for you works for you. But going in here, dealing with some of these animals, some of our exhibit animals want to make sure that the that they are happy by moving them out because oftentimes you can really only have a couple in each exhibit and moving them out of the exhibits as need be just simply to make sure that we are doing well with that. Now, there was one little spot that I think I uh, saw and then like contemplated, but it was where we had one of the education boards. And I had to be really careful about what I put here because the snow leopard habitat is right below. So I just needed to put something here. So I just took the easy route and put some rocks down there and just tried to make it simple. And then it updated the, uh, the texture there for a little bit. And then much like we did with the exhibit animals, some of our animals start to mature. So we wanted to go ahead and get them boxed up because the red pandas only want two, one boy, one girl, or like two boys, two girls, and we needed to go ahead and fix that. Also, since we got a new animal into the zoo, it did increase our reputation and improved getting our price up. So we went ahead and fixed that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will wrap up here for today. Please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so you know when I post my next video or go live. Also, let me know what you think about this content by hitting either like or dislike, and if you have the time, leaving a comment. Thank you, and until next time, have a great day.